Hi, everyone. So I am Scott Winkler, and I am a software engineer at Ellie Mae, and I'm going to be presenting on terraforming Minecraft, because it's really fun. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a Terraform enthusiast. I actually spoke at uh, HashiConf in last year about kind of interesting ways that we're using Terraform here at Ellie Mae and using Terraform Enterprise. I'm also a big fan of Golang. I, I really like the language. I've used it for a lot of personal projects. I actually wrote my little, a little game engine in Go or look for an RPG game. I'm a big fan of Minecraft. I play, I've been playing the game almost since it came out, and I've written a lot of plugins for Minecraft as well. So uh, I'll be pre later you'll see one of the plugins that I've actually written. I'm also uh, a big fan of ballroom dancing. I've been dancing for six years, and I'll, I'll be competing this weekend with my dance partner in Berkeley. So that'll be a lot of fun. I actually have uh, coattails that looks just like that, and it's, it's really a great hobby. And then finally, I wasn't always a software engineer. I started in the chemicals industry. I was working as a chemical engineer, but I just found software to be much more interesting and fun. So Minecraft, uh, you've probably heard of Minecraft, but if you haven't, if you've been living under a rock, maybe, uh, Minecraft is a really big deal right now. It's, it's a game for kids, marketed toward kids, but it's really a 3D world, kind of like Legos, where you can explore, you can build, you can use uh, software to manipulate the world. They have redstone you can do, you can make computers in Minecraft all kinds of things. It, what I like about it is it's you, a game where you do whatever you want to do. And that freedom is really the spirit of Minecraft. So one of the big things you can do with Minecraft is you can build things. So this is, this is actually my buildings that I've done in Minecraft. We, I play with my brother on a server and I, I've been working on this for a little over a year. So I, I went and mined all the blocks and I put together this, this mansion that's made of quartz and then I built a castle and some fields and stuff like that. So just having a lot of fun with Minecraft. And uh, Minecraft kind of was inspired by Legos and then later they created a Lego set based on Minecraft. So it's, it's interesting to see the culture of Minecraft and how it's come full circle in the end. So it started as an inspiration of Legos and it come, comes back. I just find that to be really fun. And then finally, people love Minecraft. I actually had a chance to uh, go to the Mine Fair here, which is one of the biggest conventions of Minecraft. And I presented actually on a different thing I had done with Minecraft, I had created a Twitter plugin for Minecraft. So you were able to uh, see visualize tweets and stuff like that in Minecraft. And that was that was really a lot of fun. So uh, just a little bit about how people uh, use Minecraft. Typically, you have uh, uh, a server that's running a uh, Minecraft and you connect to it with the Minecraft client. So this is what makes Minecraft a lot of fun is that not only can you uh, build your world by yourself, but you can play with your friends. And so these connections you can have, depending on the network capacity of the, the Minecraft server, you can have dozens or even hundreds of players concurrently in the same world, and they're all able to play together like an MMO. And so the, the Minecraft server, you can see that it actually has plugins that it can initiate. So when the, the Minecraft server starts up, it'll also start up these, these jar files that are, are plugins for Minecraft. So you can play uh, Minecraft and you can also develop for it as well. So just Terraform real quick. I'm sure you already know all about Terraform, which is why you're here. But Terraform has providers and it has resources. So the most common kinds of providers are like the AWS provider, for example, where you can create, uh, you configure the provider with access keys, you say what region you want it, and then also you declare uh, what resources you want to create. So say in this example, I want to create an instance. So 
we will be creating a, or what we created was a Minecraft provider. So we have to configure the Minecraft provider and we can create resources for that Minecraft provider, which is a lot of fun. So how do people normally use Terraform and why is, why is what we're doing so interesting? Well, first of all, people would say, you know, Terraform is an infrastructure as code tool, which is very correct to say, I would say, uh, you, you can use it to deploy instances, you can use it to deploy load balancers, a physical infrastructure that, that closely maps to the real world and kind of low level stuff. So infrastructure engineers would care a lot about Terraform, DevOps people care a lot about Terraform. And then kind of one step above that in abstraction is you have uh, platform-based services. So uh, when you combine the infrastructure in interesting ways, you kind of uh, make, maybe you make a Terraform module, maybe you, uh, you make components and, and you want people to use these as groups, then that would be for your, your platform-based approach. Uh, next, you have an application that sits on top of your platform. So maybe this is a web server, or maybe this is your APIs or, whatever it is that in the software realm typically that, that uh, defines your application and, and what makes it interesting. And Terraform can do all of these things very well. And I would say if you're doing these three things, you're, you, you have a very good understanding of, of what Terraform is good at and how it's normally being used. But I would argue that you're missing the top part of the pyramid, which is configuration or more specifically application configuration. So uh, I would make the distinction that you should have two deployments for your Terraform. You should have one that everything that your application needs to run, so the infrastructure, the platform services, the application itself, uh, starting all that up, and then you can configure the runtime service in a separate repo. So rather than pointing and clicking in the console, uh, or creating a web page that people can use like for management. It's rather messy. Whereas if you can say, if you can just give someone a Terraform repo and say, just make a pull request against this repo and it will configure the runtime application and it'll be exactly as you specify in the config. And because you've separated the concerns of the, the platform and underlying infrastructure, whatever changes they make are not gonna affect the, the deployment of the application or the health of the application itself. You don't have to worry about that. So Terraform provider, where does this idea even come from? Uh, typically people use, are familiar with the three major clouds for, ter for uh, Terraform. You have Google Cloud, you have Amazon Web Services, and Azure. But really these providers are just wrappers around APIs. So any a web service that exposes a publicly accessible API is going to be able to interact with Terraform. And more specifically, we can talk about a Minecraft web server or what a Minecraft provider. So kind of the architecture that we went with here was uh, just kind of explaining a little bit about how we use Terraform to actually communicate with Minecraft. So earlier we had shown that we had the Minecraft server and then that starts up different plugins, right? And you use the Minecraft client to connect to the Minecraft server. Well, one of these plugins that we start up can actually initialize its own application on, and then have that run on a different port than the one that Minecraft is running on. So in the initialization of, my, of uh, a plugin that I created, we have it starting up a uh, Jersey server uh, uh, and that's running on port 8080. It has a REST API, it has uh, post update uh, or post patch, get, delete, really just what you would expect from it for a, a few different endpoints. And then we created a Terraform provider for Minecraft 
that is a, a wrapper around some of these API calls. I also created an SDK because uh, the Terraform provider is obviously written in Go and making a bunch of raw HTTP requests is rather cumbersome. So I made a little SDK. Uh, and, and then when you initialize the provider, it initializes the, the client and makes those requests possible. So a little bit more about the data flow of how this works is that uh, the Terraform provider uh, is able to create resources. And uh, it's able to create resources by making API calls to the Jersey server that we have running. And then those API, uh, the, the Jersey server is able to communicate to, it, it has, uh, I injected a, a reference to the, the Minecraft server. So it's able to communicate because it's part of the, the, the Minecraft plugin to the Minecraft server using uh, a, a very bit low level library for Minecraft, uh, the Spigot library. So we had to create all the endpoints and we actually had, most of the work was done not in the provider or the SDK, but actually in implementing the, the stuff that calls, that does the library calls. And then also, of course, because it's Terraform, you're gonna have state. So that's how it knows that something has changed whether you have the old block data or the new block data. And if you're thinking this is all very complicated, it's part of a 24 hour hackathon uh, for Ellie May. So an internal hackathon that we did and we tried to see how much we can get done and whether this would be possible in 24 hours. And the fact that we were able to get it done really shows just how easy it is to use Terraform to configure your platform services. So just an example of what some of this code would look like is uh, just right here. We have a provider Minecraft and you configure it with the, uh, the address of the Minecraft server. So this is actually more specifically the Jersey server that's running. So this isn't the same as the, the Minecraft, the, the server that the Minecraft is actually running on or, or the port that the Minecraft server is running on. And then you could define a resource. So you can see that this resource defines a location. So this is actually a location in the Minecraft world, X, Y, Z, uh, because it's a three dimensional world, you have three coordinates. And then you can declare what kind of block that you want. So in this case, I want to create a diamond block, uh, a cube of diamond blocks, dimensions, length, width, height, five. So this is going to create a cube, uh, five by five by five. So let's go ahead and see that as part of a demo. So uh, let's see here. I have uh, my, my Terraform code right here. It's, it's the same as you saw in the example. I'm initializing the Terraform plugin, and then I do a Terraform plan. And it says, okay, you wanna create that, that cube of diamond blocks? That's fine. Uh, I will go ahead and create that using a Terraform apply. And we can actually see it being created in the Minecraft world. So it's a little dark, so you can't really see it too well, but I hope you see that it's actually drawing the blocks one by one. And uh, I think special thanks to John that helped write the algorithm to do that. So if I do a Terraform plan, it says, well, it's exactly what you said it should be, so I don't need to do anything. If I make changes to the block, this actually represents configuration drift uh, on the server side. So if I do a Terraform plan again, then Terraform will realize that some change has been made and then says, okay, I need to make an update. And so if you do a Terraform apply again, then it'll actually restore it to what you set, you specified that you wanted in the configuration code. And so now it's back to being a block, a cube five by five. And then finally, because uh, Terraform introduces the whole state management aspect, we can destroy it just using Terraform destroy. And you can see it's actually waiting for it to be destroyed. And when it's finished being destroyed, uh, it'll let Terraform know. And you can verify that the Terraform has actually succeeded because it's no longer in the state file, which you can verify with the Terraform state list. So that's all cool and stuff that we can make a, a cube, but what else could we do with this? 
Well, it turns out we can do a lot. In fact, we can make a castle because why not? So we have this separate project here where I'm initializing the provider again and I'm doing a Terraform plant. And here I'm creating 14 resources and we got a couple of new resources that you haven't seen before, which is the Minecraft animal and Minecraft cylinder. So this is just the, the, the code for the provider here. And uh, you can see I have three different resources. I got the Minecraft animal, Minecraft cylinder, Minecraft a cube. And here's actually the, the code, the configuration code to, to configure my application. So this isn't the same as my infrastructure code, not really. It's for configuring, the Minecraft server is already running. I could have created it separately. Oh, and here you can see that the, it's actually creating the towers, it's creating the walls, it's creating the floor. And you, you can see that Terraform is creation complete and it's, it's waiting and waiting. And what's great is that you can have the dependency management of Terraform. Oh, and finally, I draw the animals at the end. And I created a little door too, because why not? Uh, I have some sheep here and I have a little pig. And it's pretty awesome, actually. So if you wanted to deploy this in your own Minecraft server, you definitely could. Uh, so this is really awesome. And we have a little bit extra time. So I'm going to just show this video again, because it's really great. My, uh, so this was uh, really an, an interesting project. Uh, we had a lot of fun with this. And we only have three resources right now, animals, cylinder, uh, cube. But we could definitely create more. Some of the other ones we had thought to be able to create was maybe like a pyramid or schematics because some people, they, they create schematics of like a, a very detailed castle. And so you might want to be able to do something like that instead of using the very low level like cubes and stuff like that. So when I create it, you can see actually that the four towers are being created together. So this is part of the, the concurrency aspect of Terraform. And it, you know, it's creating on the different threads. And then I've also created dependencies between the, the walls. That's why they're created one at a time rather than all at once. Although they could have been made all at once. And then also I had to put a dependency for the animals and uh, the, the floor because I want the animals to be created after the floor has been created. And then finally, you can see that I have sheep and I have a pig. The sheep don't have a name. And uh, that's because I actually use the count parameter in order to create three of them. And then, but the pig does have a name. It's an optional uh, attribute for the animal resource. So that's about all I have to show. I just wanted to give special thanks to the two developers that helped me on this project for the hackathon, uh, John Love. So he did all, all the work for creating the cubes one at a time, adding the little custom animations, making sure that the, we're getting the stateful data and then being able to destroy it. So that was, that was really helpful. And then also uh, Snahal, who kind of helped with the, the writing the Jersey code. And then, um, of course, we do want to open source this at some point. So we don't have it ready just yet. It's a little, the code's a little messy, but if you just follow us on, uh, or follow me on Twitter, then you can get some updates on when we'll, this will be open source if you're interested in, in con contributing to the project. So thank you very much. And I'm able to uh, answer any questions at this time. Thanks, Scott. Oh, can you import existing Minecraft builds? So uh, that's what I had alluded to with the schematic. Uh, there's actually a plugin called World Edit that allows you to save your, uh, uh, your world uh, or like sections of your world as a schematic file, which is a binary file. And so I could cr implement a, a Terraform resource that allows you to upload that schematic file and then using World Edit to paste it into place. Like that would be very doable and uh, that, I wish I had been able to get that done. How are you linking resources from Terraform to actual items in Minecraft? Are they custom resources you've defined, i.e. you've created every item in order to use all items in Minecraft? 
Um, well, I think I understand that question. So the Minecraft server offers an API, which is extremely low level. I mean, we're talking about you can change a block or you can read the state of something like that. But uh, I, I've kind of created an abstraction over that by saying, okay, well, I'm gonna say, say a user probably doesn't care about individual blocks. They probably care about things like cubes or cylinders. So this is an abstraction that I've done over Terraform. And, and I've created an API that makes that process easier. Uh, you could create, you could add new endpoints for doing whatever you want. And then the Terraform aspect of it is just a kind of a shim around the, the API because all of the work is being done on the API side. Thank you. Glad you glad you like the the demo. How about using Terraform to manage the server configuration, like adding plugins, etc. Actually, that's something I wish I had time to demo to uh, demo as well. Uh, you can actually deploy a Minecraft server like on an EC2 instance or a Docker container, and you can write a startup script to initialize Minecraft, start up the plugin, or install the plugins, run the Minecraft server. So that's kind of what I'm talking about when, for the infrastructure and, and the uh, platform aspect of it. And then making the separation that, okay, well, now the Minecraft server is already running, so now I have a different Terraform script that'll configure it. So you definitely could use Terraform for managing the server configuration and whatnot. I, I also have uh, these on YouTube, which I could share links to these videos if anyone is interested in sharing with the kids or something like that. And definitely looking for open source con contributors because I, 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 I don't know anyone that's created anything as cool as this for a Terraform provider. So this is a lot of fun. And for Minecraft too, it's, it's a great learning opportunity for kids especially. To kind of see what's possible with coding and that they, they can use something they already know and love, which is Minecraft to explore software development. Any more questions? Someone in the chat is asking you to please post your YouTube page. Uh, okay. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Okay, uh, I'm just Scott Winkler here. And I, I posted both videos that I, I submitted here. They don't have any sound and they're not the greatest videos, but uh, you can at least see the castle being created. So that's, that's pretty great. I don't know where I should uh, paste that though. Uh, the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom, there'll be a chat. And if you click that, you can post it there. There we go. Oh, there you go. And I, someone is asking for that link as well on the YouTube live comment. So I'm just gonna go put it there for them. Yeah, so we'll have the, uh, we'll have it open, we'll have the code open sourced but sometime early next week. Uh, I still want to organize the code a little bit better. We did get it done in 24 hours, so it's it's uh, it's a little rough around the edges. But uh, I tried to organize as best I can, you know, facing Java uh, best practices and 
So once we got the, it was actually the hardest to get the first resource done in the cube. I, I think it took us 18 hours of the 24 hour hackathon just to get the first resource done. But then once we did that, it came together really fast. We found we were able to add new resources within about an hour or two, uh, just because all of the groundwork had been done. Because there's actually a lot of moving parts. You, you have the Terraform provider, you have the SDK, you have all the, the resources in, in Minecraft. But once a lot of that's done, then you just add a new class, you implement a certain interface, and you're done. It's really great, really easy to use. Yeah, another plugin I had done for Minecraft was uh, actually creating a world in, uh, for Twitter. So visualizing uh, your Twitter resources, like uh, you can, it creates a little town for you in, in Minecraft based on your users that follow you. And you can see their house, you can, you can talk to them, you can see their tweets, you can actually like their tweets in Minecraft. So there's a lot of cool things that you can do with 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 uh, plugins in Minecraft, and it, as long as uh, as as long as you're having fun, that's all that really matters. So any more questions? I don't have the videos for the, the Twitter plugin posted, but if, if anyone's interested in that, I could share that. And I, I did open source that code too. I, I like to create a lot of different plugins for Minecraft, but the Terraform one has been an idea I've had for a few months now, and it was just so much fun to, to implement that. And it makes me realize that you could really create a Terraform provider for just about anything. And it's really not that hard. If you look at, at the source code at the providers, they're just calling APIs. So uh, if you want to create your own Terraform provider, I would recommend looking at some of the simpler ones, not the AWS provider, it's got too much, but just look at a very simple Terraform provider. And then you see that there, there's some boilerplate code that you need to implement. But once you got that, it's, it's very straightforward. 